Welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome, folks. Come on in. Give this a few moments um, while we wait for everyone to join us. I'm Don. I'll probably reintroduce myself in a minute or two. We'll give folks a chance to jump into the session. We're really excited to have you here today. Excited to share some VR knowledge and how to create your own virtual worlds in Code HS. Got a lot of awesome folks with me today to help you along the way and share some experiences. Just give it another couple minutes. If you'd like, in the beginning, uh, in the chat, we're going to open up the chat in the beginning and also at the end of the, of, the, of the session. If you'd like to introduce yourself and where you're coming, where you're um, joining us from, uh, and also you can share how many students you have in your class so we can kind of know how many folks are, you know, joining us for this activity. Um, go ahead and put that in chat if you'd like. Feel free to do that. We you know we're, like I said, we're really excited to have you here. So thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we'll get started in earnest in just a couple minutes here because I can still see uh, folks joining. So we want to give everyone a chance to do that. And uh, come on in. Caitlin, welcome. Nancy, welcome as well. Folks coming in from all over the country. I love it. Uh, this is such a great medium for us to be able to reach out to you no matter where you are and, and share and have your students do some really fun stuff. Um, we've been having some some folks experimenting with taking their virtual worlds they create in Code HS and also putting it into like things like a MetaQuest or Google Cardboard, things like that. So um, this is really awesome. Stephanie, welcome. Glad to have you here. Like I said, we'll just give it another two minutes, two, three minutes, and then uh, we'll, we'll get started with this and, uh, and share some virtual worlds with you. Again, if you have questions throughout, yeah, feel free to put those in the Q&A session. We'll open up the chat in the beginning uh, if for you to let us know who you are and where you're coming in from. We'll also open up the chat at the end so that your students can share their projects in the chat and we can take a look at those and maybe and, and click on some of those and look at some of the, the, uh, the virtual worlds that are created. Uh, but throughout, if you have questions that come up, if someone's having any difficulties, if any students are running into any problems, uh, we've got a lot of folks here that have a lot of knowledge and, and uh, we'd be happy to help smooth out any bumps in the road uh, as we go. So again, welcome those of you that are still joining right now. Uh, go ahead, if, you, if you'd like, uh, go ahead in the chat, uh, say who you are and where your classroom is in the country or in the world, and uh, let us know how many students you have there. Uh, we're, we're excited to have you with us today. And just about another minute, we're gonna get rolling and folks that join in and after that, I'll make sure that I you know, cover anything else. Uh, and this is being recorded. If you wanted to watch this again later or share this with another period of students that might not be here right now, uh, that's all options for you. All right. And with that, I think we will get rolling. It's been about four or five minutes now. So um, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for our live hour of code, creating virtual worlds. Uh, my name's Don and I'm a curriculum developer at Code HS. Uh, I was a teacher in the classroom for over 20 years and I used Code HS since it first started 10 years ago. And uh, I loved it so much that I wanted to come and join this amazing company. So. We've got some really great folks with us today. We have Athena with us today. She's our, our marketing manager at Code HS. We have uh, Matt as well. You can see his name on the screen there. He's a fellow curriculum designer with me. And we have professional development specialists, MR and Joni. They're also with us. And most importantly, we have a guest speaker today as well, uh, Kate Marshall. 
and she's going to talk a little bit about her experiences using code in the professional world. Uh, and our whole team is here to make sure all of your questions are answered and to help you with any problems that might come up. And to make sure if you do have questions that arise during the during this, uh, go to the Q and A session, and definitely you know let us know and we'll answer those questions right away. We've got a lot of folks that are ready to help you out. Uh, and if you haven't already put in the chat. Uh, who you are and where you're coming in from, you can go ahead and do that. We'll have the chat open a little bit longer. And uh, we're really happy to have you here today. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, what we're going to do, here's our our hour of code agenda. Uh, we're going to start off, uh, I just introduced everybody. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what code is used for first. And we're going to start off with our guest speaker, uh, Kate Marshall, who works for Alaska Airlines using code in the real world. After that, I'm going to walk you through the creating virtual worlds activity. And then after you've had a chance to create some worlds of your own, um, then we'll ask you to maybe share some of your projects and, and answer any questions and talk about next steps and, and give you a chance to um, fill out a little survey at the end as well to let us know how we're doing. So let's jump in. Uh, let's talk about what code is used for. Before we talk about virtual reality, let's actually talk about coding in the real world. And, you know, coding is used for pretty much everything that you do that's digital. Anything that's on your phone, any website you go to, every single company has to use it. And we have a real live example of how code is used uh, with, via our guest speaker today, Kate. So with that, uh, I'm gonna introduce Kate and then I'm gonna turn it over to her for a moment or for her to talk for speak to speak for a while. And then uh, we'll jump back into our act activity after that. Kate is a business intelligence analyst and a lead at Alaska Airlines. She uses code to turn big data into valuable insights. And then Alaska Airlines can take those insights and the interpretation of what that data is telling Kate and use that to you know, make good decisions for the company and, and formulate plans and, and create strategies. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna turn it over to Kate. Thank you for joining us, Kate. Awesome, thank you, Don, and thank you everyone for having me. Let me get my screen set up. Are you guys able to see it? Absolutely. Wonderful. All right, well, thank you so much for having me, everyone. Um, I, like Don said, my name is Kate and I work at Alaska Air. Um, Alaska Air is a US-based uh, airline. So for those of you who are more on the East Coast, you might not be as familiar, um, but we are the, we were the fifth largest, um, but after the merger of JetBlue and Spirit, we are actually the sixth largest airline now in the US. Uh, and it's a very, very cool industry. So I'll start off talking a little bit about um, why the airline industry is awesome. So number one, we have planes, a uh, very cool piece of technology and quite literally have millions and millions of parts within them. Uh, and that leads to tons of data that um, our team has to make sense of. Um, lots of opportunity there specifically with the planes. And uh, it's kind of cool because we fly both Boeing and Airbus, um, which a lot of you may have heard of, uh, some of the top uh, airline manufacturers in the world. Um, and so that is an amazing, um, amazing experience to be able to work with some of companies like that. I think the two um, other goals and what makes it really fun is that we really try to provide a good customer experience. Uh, a lot of you have probably flown before and you want to make sure you're there on time. You want good snacks on board. You want friendly flight attendants um, and you just want to make sure the experience is really good. And we strive to make sure that's really um part of the business and coding does play a role in that. And I'll get into some examples in a minute. Uh, we also wanna make sure that the business is efficient. We're looking at market trends. We're trying to target new customers. We're trying to bring old customers back. We're trying to make sure that we are the, um, the airline that you can fly with the best deal. And we're just basically beating out our customers like by the last dollar. It's, it's definitely a fight out there. And, and it's really fun to be able to um, use data to make insights within a market. And then also uh, one of the things that most people working for an airline will tell you is that we all get free flights and that is definitely a perk. 
All right, so specifically, uh, my role is in business intelligence, and business intelligence is kind of a mixture of business strategy and coding. So specifically, we use uh, Python, SQL, sometimes R, a little bit of Java, but typically we work more on the number side with data. And um, from there, we usually try to find uh, insights, and then we make visualizations. And these visualizations and insights is what helps drive the business forward. Um, some of the tools that we use, uh, Tableau, SSRS, Power BI, New Relic, any tool that will help you um, make graphs, charts, uh, forms, uh, anything that will really help the average person who is not as familiar with data or coding be able to read the same insights that we're seeing in an easy way. And then, of course, on my team, um, some of our more technical folks, uh, our data scientists, they started to dabble into things like machine learning, AI modeling, predictive modeling. A really good example of this is um, with planes. We've been able to develop a, a system that tracks what's broken on the plane last. And from there, we can predict what part will most likely break next based off of time, based off of historical data. And um, inferring that helps that you get out on time, you get to your destination safely, and everything is okay with the plane because you don't want anything bad going wrong with the plane when it's in the air. So one more specific example of something we would do, this chart on the right uh, details something that we would basically present to um, a business leader. In this specific case, uh, we would start from transforming survey data, your customer data, what flights you're on. We pull all of that data in and then we will transform it using either SQL or Python. And from there, we'll look for trends. You know, where in our surveys are we finding people are unhappy? Where are they, you know, taking the most time? How can we make the experience better for them? And then from there, we'll make a visualization and present to business leaders and say, this, these are the areas we need to tackle. So if you look at the chart right here, um, most of you, if you've flown before, can probably relate. So right now, one of our top pain points for guests is having their flight delayed or canceled. Uh, this is definitely one of the things we don't want to have happen, and it is, as you can see, one of the top drivers of customers being unhappy. Then you can see things like gate agents. Maybe they had a bad experience. There was some rudeness or there was a situation happening where they couldn't get what they wanted. Um, this is another pain point. And then, of course, you see other things like going through TSA and security maybe took too long. The food and beverage. We might have been out of Sprite that day on an aircraft. Um, all these things, we want to know what is making our customers unhappy so that we can then change those to make them happy. So my final points here uh, will be that I think uh, coding is something that in the airline industry really brings us forward. Uh, it brings us into the 21st century and beyond. It makes us save money. It makes us faster. And it provides really, really uh, valuable insights to the business. And if anyone is interested, um, I definitely recommend exploring a career in the aviation industry. If you have any questions for Kate, uh, go ahead and put those uh, into the Q&A and, and we'd be happy to give her, read those to her and let her answer those as well. Um, you know, I have a a couple questions as well myself. Uh, what would you say is your favorite part about working at Alaska Air and using technology in your role? I think my favorite part is when we find something that normally would not be found in the data. So uh, we have so much data and um, we have a lot of people who are on the ground every day and they might see um, some really uh, cool insights, but there's things the data can tell you that you would never notice. And so what I really love about using technology is when we're able to pull in some of those insights and then from there actually make a change in the business. Um, one example is uh, we have been able to start tracking um, how many people we think we think will bring a carry on on board. And this will actually help uh, flight attendants if we have planes with 
higher predicted numbers of carry-ons, you can actually start the boarding process a little bit earlier and then get people on in their seats and you have a better chance of leaving on time. Uh, so that would be an example of technology showing the business, um, let's prepare for higher volumes and let's get out on time. That's pretty awesome. I, I've had to do some flying across the country recently and I, it's always nice when and I've used Alaska Air recently and it was to go to San Diego and it was it was a pretty awesome seamless flight. It's neat to know that you're using AI and machine learning and, and data and visualizations to, to make that experience better for the users. Uh, I would I have one more question as, as question if questions come in from the students we'll I will definitely uh, pass those along to you, but I have one one more question. What advice would you have for students both listening now live? or those that may watch the recording later about pursuing a career in computer science? Yeah, I mean, my biggest piece of advice and uh, a lot of people in the industry that you'll talk to didn't start out necessarily in computer science because it's such a new field. Uh, I would say because of that, so many of us are willing to um, get new people in the door. I would say reach out to people, go job shadow, ask for internships. Like we are very hungry to have the new generation come work for us and, and learn. And so I think specifically in this career, you'll be able to find a lot of people willing to let you in. That's fantastic. Um, thank you very much for sharing this uh, with all of us. You know, it's, it's always great. Uh, I read your Coding in the Wild blog as well. And I thought that was fantastic. And it's just really nice for students to be able to tie the learning that they're doing on CodeHS to real live careers and people that are actually out in the field. So we really appreciate you sharing with us. And uh, you can, if you want to stick around for a little while, if any other questions come in, uh, we'll let you know. And uh, it was really, really awesome of you to share this with us. So thank you very much, Kate. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. Absolutely. Uh, so folks that are, are here and you've got your, you're ready to start learning how to use to create virtual worlds, uh, let's get started. I've got a little bit of background. Uh, the first thing I wanna ask you to just think about is what is virtual reality? I'm sure that you've thought of Oculus or Meta or some other Google Cardboard or some other platform where you're in a virtual world or maybe you've seen virtual reality in a movie. Um, and then I'm curious how folks out there have also used virtual reality. Uh, if you have any examples of ways that you've vir used virtual reality, you could put those, um, you know, you could put those, ask about them in Q&A. You can volunteer those. We'd love to, to talk about those as well. Uh, for those of you that really don't have a lot of experience with, with virtual reality, uh, <clears throat> it's an immersive 3D computer generated world that you can interact with as if you were in that world. So you put some sort of uh, head apparatus or goggles or gear. There's many different types of virtual reality. There's Microsoft versions, there's Meta, um, there's Google versions. There's, there's a lot of different types. There's Sony has, has virtual reality um, and there's Vive and, and, and there's like, I've tried them all. And they're all pretty awesome. I really enjoy it. And it's a little different than augmented reality, which is another thing for another day, but how is it used in the world? Well, if you've ever played video games like Beat Saber, that's virtual reality. And uh, it's pretty awesome. My daughters love Beat Saber. And uh, we often play and then we project it to the TV so you can see what the person in their virtual world is doing. And uh, that's just one way. Another way is for training for folks. Let's say that a fo a somebody is training to be a pilot, uh, whether it's an airplane, or a helicopter or something like that, or even like a, a, a space shuttle or something along those lines, VR is used to do live training without putting the person who's learning how to fly the plane or the helicopter in danger and making sure that they can do trial runs before they take off. There are also medical professionals uh, or teachers or folks that can use VR to practice things like surgery or you know doing anything with the human body or you know very highly complex medical procedures that can be practiced without putting any patients in danger as well um, there are lessons that are used throughout schools 
you know, there are folks that, that might learn about uh, artifacts or various times in history or things like that, uh, where VR can take the person to that place that might be either no longer exist or not exist in the current state or be very difficult to get to in the world somewhere else. And VR is a way of bringing that to a student, bringing it to you, the students or the teachers. Sometimes folks may have uh, various types of anxieties or phobias or things like that. And VR can be used to help with, help with some of those medical issues to help folks be able to overcome certain things that may be causing them anxiety or other problems as well. Um, there are folks that perhaps uh, a soldier who may have been injured in a conflict somewhere in the world uh, who may have uh, phantom limb syndrome or something wrong uh, where they're trying to reacclimate and learn how to use a prosthetic device or something like that. And VR can be used in those medical situations too to help those folks uh, to, to be able to reacclimate and um, feel more comfortable with the prosthetic limbs. And also there are folks that just create art. There are a number of different ap applications and where folks can make sculptures and paintings in the, in the virtual world. Um, and those are really amazing. And uh, I've seen, I saw a show actually that was in San Francisco when I used to live there where you walked in and uh, you had goggles where you could still see the room, but it was augmented reality, which is close. And you could see virtual sculptures all around the room. Um, so this is another way that VR is used. So what we're going to be using today is actually called A-Frame. A-Frame is a web framework that you can use through CodeHS to build virtual worlds and VR experiences. Uh, it's based on, on top of a language that displays websites called HTML, uh, which is uh, something that some of you may be familiar with. I'll give you a really quick breakdown of HTML in case you don't know what that is. Um, which uses another language called JavaScript and a library, which is a set of code somewhere else that can be pulled in and used in an application or a website or things like this. So we're going to be using A-Frame today in CodeHS, uh, but you probably want some of you might wonder, well, what is HTML? Uh, you're, you're telling me words and acronyms that I'm not sure what they are. Uh, it, HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. It's not necessarily a programming language. It's a way to show web browsers how to display websites. And uh, HTML, it uses things called tags. So if you see this B before I love VR and this B with a slash in front of it, the first B is called an opening tag. The second B is a closing tag. B is for bolding. So if you put this B and this closing B before and after the words, I love VR, and you put that on a website, it tells the website to show I love VR in a bolded type. And there are many different tags used in HTML in many different ways. And we have an HTML, we have a web design course that you can take that will teach you about those things uh, if you're really interested in learning to use HTML. Like I said, HTML is made up of tags that take text or images or animations or VR in, in the case of A-Frame and tell the web browser, hey, this is how I want this to look and how it should be displayed. There's the opening and closing tags, like I said. And uh, that's a general overview of how HTML works. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a look at creating virtual worlds. Uh, we're gonna put a link into the chat and that link will take you to today's hour of code. Uh, so if, if you click on that link, it's it's actually uh, codehs.com um, and slash HOC underscore VR. And that link is in the chat. You can click that. You should have a uh, the ability to go to that activity. And I'm gonna walk you through what we're gonna be doing in that activity. And then I'm gonna turn you loose to try to do some of the activities yourself. Um, You'll be able to do an intro to A-Frame where you'll be able to look around the virtual world a little bit. We'll give you the code that shows a sphere. You'll be able to modify that sphere a little bit, maybe make it a little bit bigger or smaller, change the color, things like that. And then we'll have various examples for you to, to look at and change various things with. 
And then you'll be able to make your own scene or make your own world at the very end. So like I said, A-Frame is, uses HTML, which is tells web browsers, hey, this is what this should look like in the web browser to take and create 3D elements in this virtual world. When you're in A-Frame in Code HS, you can click and use the mouse to almost like you're, you're directing a camera to look left and right or up and down or all around if you want to physically move the camera. So that would be like, if I'm standing still and I wanted to point the camera up or down, if I had like a video camera, if I was using a phone to film, that would be your mouse. If you wanted to actually walk backwards or walk forward or walk left or right, then you would use the W, A, S, and D keys on the keyboard. W would walk you forward, S would walk you backwards, and then A to the left and D to the right. And you'll be able to play around with that some in just a moment when you jump in. So in the 3D world, something that I wanted to make sure that I told you about is that there are three axes. Now, if you're thinking about a graph in a math class, you'd have the x-axis along the horizon and the y to the sky vertical axis. Well, in 3D, you have a third axis, the Z axis, which is coming right at you or going straight away from you. And that third axis is what makes you know the 3D world unique. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the values on these axes. You'll notice that uh, this graphic actually has one error. There's a Y to the po positive, but that's going downwards. Uh, the Y up is positive, down is negative, just like math. X is positive going to the right. X is negative going to the left, just like a math class. And then with the Z axis, which is the axis that's going straight towards you or straight away from you, positive is coming towards you, negative is going away from you. And that's an important point that I wanna bring up when, we, when you start to use this, you have to make sure that the Z values that you set for your objects have to have a negative value so that they show up. Otherwise you'd have to back up, back up, back up just to be able to see them. Uh, but we'll get to that in just a moment. So with the intro to A-Frame in the activity, you know, you're going to be able to practice moving around in the virtual world. So you the, the link is still in the chat if you haven't already clicked on it to get into the activity. There's a video at the beginning of the activity, but I'm covering most of the things that are in the video right now. You could watch that later if you'd like, uh, but I'm talking about most of those things right now. So you don't necessarily have to watch the videos, but you can look at the examples and you can do the activities right now uh, live while we're here and we can help you with any questions you might have as well. Um, so with the intro to A-Frame and, and, and the example of a sphere, uh, let me make sure that I have the examples here. So this is the, 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 the viewing the world. So this is viewing the VR world. It's the very first thing after the video. And if you want to see the, the VR things that you create in Code HS, there's a little button up to the top right up here, this little button that's up here, which pops it out in its own browser window like this. And now you can see if I click the mouse and hold, I can look left, I can look right, I can look down like this, I can look up like that. That's like if I'm standing still. And then if I hit the S key, I can back up. If I hit the W key, I can move forward. Now I passed it up, I have to back up some. I can hit the A key to go to the left and the D key to go to the right. And that's how you navigate the world and how you pop it up in its own browser window, which is kind of nice. Um, another thing you'll see this example for, for a sphere. Make sure I have the sphere example. This is it right here. So here are two spheres. And something that I want to point out to you is the code, all right? So there are some code here. This is all HTML. You'll see there's an opening tag up top and a closing tag. HTML has a head and a body. But what you need to worry about right now is this A dash scene, and A dash sphere. This code in here is what's displaying the spheres on the screen. And if I go back to this code here, you know, I just showed you the viewing the world and I showed you the sphere as well. Uh, modifying the elements that are in this world is a, is a matter of taking these other things, these, they're called attributes. 
So in HTML, you have different, they're kind of like variables that you'd have in code where you can change the position and this is X, Y, and Z. Notice the Z is a negative number because it has to be in front of you. Otherwise it'd be behind you. You'd have to press the S key to back up to see it. The radius of a sphere that's, you know, um, that controls how large it is. And then the color of the sphere. Attributes are always in quotes. You'll notice there's quotes around them. They're not always in quotes depending on what it is. But for now, you can just assume that all of the attributes are in quotes. And uh, you can go in and you can change the attributes. So if you're in this world with the sphere, if I go here and I want to change, and the colors, you can look up the colors in the docs. There's a docs section here. Uh, but if you want to just try some different colors, like instead of this front one being purple, I'm going to make it green. And I'm going to make the radius 10. Got to be careful because these attributes for radius are set in meters. So that things can get really large really fast. Now, if I hit refresh in this little browser over here, you can see that the green sphere got much larger. I might have to actually back up with the S key a little bit so you can see that see that actually. And I could, you know, I could make it a little smaller if I want. I could make it very small. I could make it a radius of one and hit refresh. And now it's a very tiny sphere. Um, again, you want to be careful with the position. If you change the position drastically, you might not see it. You're like, it disappeared, it's gone. It might be because uh, the positioning of it was changed. Remember the first number in position is X, the second one is Y, and the third one is Z. Uh, so that's how you modify the elements with the attributes. Here are some general, a general rule of thumb for your attributes for position. You wanna keep the X somewhere between negative five and five, so you can see it either going left or right on the, on the, on the, on the X axis. For Y, somewhere between negative 15 and positive 15 will make it appear right away, you can see it. And for Z, you have to make sure the Z is a negative number. Other, because you start off in the middle of the grid, zero, 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 or really close to zero, zero, zero. And so it's almost like you're standing right in the middle of that X, Y, Z axis. So putting things in the Z axis at a negative value is gonna place it in front of you so you can actually see it. And there's the grid again, or the, the, the three axes. The radius is set to meters, you know, so some value I'd say, don't make it too large. If you make the radius a hundred or 500, it's just gonna fill up the whole screen. It's gonna be so big, you, it'll just look like one big color. Um, and then the colors can be changed uh, to general, you know, it, it understands general terms for colors, blue, red, green, yellow, um, and there are some other ones. And now you'll ha you have a chance now to kind of go in and look at some of the exercises. There's a transform your sphere exercise where you can go in and play around with the position, the radius and the color with this, this, this is the transform your sphere exercise. We also have a ring, a ring of roses. And that activity is going to have, as I close this and you take a look, it has a number of spheres that are in here already. And your job is to go in and change it so that it goes green, purple, green, purple, green. And you'll notice a couple of these, this one's missing a color, this one's missing a color, and this one as well. And you can put the proper colors in and then you can hit refresh up here and then you'll be able to submit and continue with that activity. And then we also have this planes activity where you'll be able to adjust the rotation of the planes. Um, and so you can have a plane is like the floor. Uh, some of these activities will have a plane already there. Like for the ring of roses, you'll notice there is a floor as I, Click here and I back up some, back up a lot actually. There is a floor there. This, this black object is a floor. And if you look down here, this code that says A dash plane, the color is black. There's the position width and the height and the rotation. To make it flat, the X is negative 90 and then zero, zero for the, for the uh, Y and the Z. But you could rotate a plane in lots of different directions. And that's what the example activity 
planes shows you. There's still the black plane that's, that's the floor, but some of them are rotated sideways and some of them are rotated, you know, backwards or forwards and, and, and et cetera. So, and that activity, you'll be able to play around with some of these. And again, careful with the positions and how, how you rotate them uh, with the planes, because sometimes it, you might not be able to see it. And if you if you have any trouble with that, you can always let us know. We'll we can give you a a, a hand with that. And you just throw something in the Q and A if you have any questions about it. And uh, and then we also have a create the floor where you you'll be creating and adjusting a plane in this activity. So this activity will walk you through how to create the ground and make a plane that's ten by ten, and you can follow that and it continue. And then you can always go back and copy some of the code from your activities and you can use them in what's going to be the final activity, which will be to make a scene. And uh, that's where we have an example where there's a soccer goal. It's the World Cup. So this is very appropriate and a green field and a line here with a ball. And uh, you'll be able to go through the, some examples and uh, go through and make a scene for yourself. So this is like just an example of the VR scene. And uh, we also have the documents tab, which I wanna show you before I let you start creating your own stuff. If you go up here next to output where it says docs, there's a lot of great stuff in here um, about anything we just talked about, adding a plane or a box or a cone or putting a sky in, different colors you can use, textures. You can put animations in as well. Uh, we have a lot of different stuff that you can put in when you're making your own world um, after you work through some of these activities and, 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 and examples. So make, make a scene is what we're, we're, we're really excited to see what you come up with. Um, and so you'll be making that scene. And uh, like I said, there's some other elements in, in here as well. You can take a look. We'll put these, we'll put these two links in the chat as well. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Lori, created a couple of these scenes with other elements in them. And then there's a, there's some code in there that shows a couple of animations as well. So we'll put those these two links in chat and you could take a look at those as well as the doc tab, which shows you how to do lots of really neat stuff. So it's your turn to shine. We're really excited to give you a chance to dive in and you can do some of this as well. If you have an account, you just log in to your CodeHS account and you, you start off with transform your sphere. You work through the activities that I just showed you. If you don't have an account, uh, you can still click and uh, you, can, you can click the, this hour of code activity and uh, you'll, your progress will not be saving if you don't have an account. So if you do have an account, awesome, you'll be able to save your progress. If you don't, uh, you wanna make sure that you copy your code and build on the previous stuff. Um, but your progress, once you leave, won't, won't be saved, just so you know that. Oops. And uh, we're going to give you some time now to work on this uh, in your classes. And if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to put those questions in the Q&A. And uh, we'll give you some time right now to work. And uh, we're really you know, excited to have you doing this. And we're really excited to have you with us here today. So I'll stop talking for a moment and uh, I'll give you a chance to do some work as well. And uh, Matt, I know you always have really cool music. So if you wanted to give them some creative VR making tunes, feel free to share that. And like I said, you know, we're here the whole time. So if you want to ask us questions, we'd be happy to, we'd be happy to uh, give you any assistance.
it's really fun to use some of these objects and change them and make them different sizes, and things like that. Made hey, the Don, sphere disappear. Up, sorry, Don, let's put up the uh, slide um, that shows there that what the X and Y and Z have to be between slide number 24. I think that'll be a great reference Absolutely. for the students to have as they're working along to remember what Absolutely. those numbers are. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, when I first started using A-Frame, I had to figure out why I couldn't see my stuff. And I realized I was using a positive value for Z and everything was behind me. And after backing up, backing up, backing up and backpedaling, I was able to see the stuff on the screen. I also made the radius 50 for one of my first objects, which made it 50 meters. It was a very, very, very large sphere. It took up the entire screen versus a radius of one or 1 1.2 or something like that. I, I think I saw a hand raised ever so briefly. Um, if you do have any questions, let us know. And absolutely, uh, you can put questions in the Q&A as well. We're, uh, we're all here for you.
we'll give all of you a little more time to keep working right now. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look through the example exercises that I showed you and the examples as well and use some of that code. There's also towards the end of the activity, uh, a really neat uh, section that uh, I'll share with you that you can look at now or later, you know, to add to your worlds where we have, a, it's, it's the very last uh, A-frame examples that's in the hour of code before you get your badge. It has a bunch of really neat stuff. Um, like you can see, this is based off of the movie uh, Ready Player One, what's in the Oasis where somebody created a, a, a nice grid and there's different things that click on and this is all in A-frame, really cool. Has sound effects built in. When you roll over one of these, it makes, it makes sounds. Um, you can do other things with A-frame. You can do hand tracking. Uh, you know, you can do anime user interfaces. You can see that it gets pretty complicated. Uh, if you, you, you might start today with spheres and things like that, and you might end up making games or worlds someday, you know, that are just like the ones you might see in your headset. If you ever used a VR headset, uh, there's all kinds of different things, you know, in different ways and different examples and stuff. So this is towards the end of the activity. Uh, you'll be able to, to check this out too. So just wanted to make sure I showed you that and uh, let you keep working a little bit longer. And then we'll do a little bit of sharing and a little bit of wrap up. And uh, if there are any questions, we'll do that as well. I'll give you a few more minutes to keep working. And then after we're done today, by all means, keep working and keep this going uh, and keep creating. You know, uh, we're really excited to have you take what you learned today and keep on creating in the, into the future and making uh, more virtual worlds and keep learning how to code. And then hopefully going off into college and studying computer science and being like Kate Marshall and working for a company, doing something you love someday. So coding in the wild.
So we're coming up upon the hour uh, that we wanted to have you join us for. Um, I'd like to put it out there if, if any of you teachers or students um, have any projects that you'd like to share, please feel free to do that. We've opened up the chat. Um, you know, if you're, if you're having, if you'd like anyone to share anything you might've created, uh, we would be happy to see that and take it from the chat and uh, show it on my screen if you'd like. As well, while you're doing that or thinking about doing that, um, I'm also gonna give my colleague Matt a chance to, to show us uh, how to share this. If you have Google Cardboard or if you have a MetaQuest or something like that, you are able to share it. You can, you can share it into those devices uh, using a VR button that is in the CodeHS interface. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a brief moment and uh, I'm gonna let Matt take over and share that feature with you. Thanks, Don. Um, yeah, uh, some questions uh, from teachers and, and students in the past that I've received uh, regarding using A-Frame, uh, your projects that you create in A-Frame and how you can get that on your phone. Um, so I know some students might want to share this on their phone and put it maybe in like a, a viewer of some kind, maybe a Google Cardboard or a, a headpiece uh, type thing. Um, when you render any of your, your um 3D environments, um, when you're rendering it here in the output, you'll notice there's a little VR button down here at the bottom. And uh, what you can do is, first of all, uh, pop this out into another tab, and that'll show just the web environment piece. And then you can take your um, HTML, your link up here, and open that up in any web browser that you have um, on your phone. Uh, so just open up like Safari or uh, Chrome or whatever. And once you've done that, then click this VR button. And what that'll do is um, on my screen, it blows it up into full screen. But what it'll do on your phone is actually split it into two separate uh, viewing uh, capabilities. So that way you can um, view that correctly on your uh, VR display. So that's that little button down there. That's what that's for. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, so enjoy checking those out and you can move and rotate around in your world um, using any one of those kinds of viewers with your phone if you'd like to do that. Thank you, Matt, for sharing that. I'm going to go to the uh, slideshow and uh, if we have any, like I said, if anybody wants to go ahead and share, you can. Otherwise, we can give you a little bit of a wrap up as well. Um, you can ask questions in the Zoom Q&A uh, as well. Like we've been mentioning, you can ask your teacher if you have any. Uh, just some questions for you to think about. It, you know, what were some of the challenging parts of using A-Frame? I know that personally for me, sometimes not using the axis the right way or making my objects too big was a little bit challenging for me personally. Um, what did you like the most about this activity? You know, uh, when you're thinking about the attributes, those are the things in the quotes that you use to set the color and the size or how much something's rotated or things like that. Um, you know, which ones were the most important when you did that. And a question for you to think about as we go on was, you know, wh what impact do you think virtual reality will have on our lives in the future? It's already very much a part of our lives now, you know, like I showed you some of those slides earlier about how it's used in simulators and teaching people how to fly planes and surgeons, how to do very delicate surgeries and in the gaming industry. And um, it's only going to become more and more intertwined with what we do. Um, it's just something for you to think about, you know, as we go through. Uh, so there's some of those things. If you'd like to share any of these things with us now, or if you want to share them with a family member or a friend or something like that, in your Code HS viewer, you can go to the More tab, you know, in the Code HS interface, and then you can go down to Share. There's a Share option, and then you can create a Share link, and then you can send that link to anybody. 
mom, dad, best friend, uh, anybody you wanted to send your program to, you can create a share link and share that. And if you wanted to send it, send it to us at Code HS, you know, we keep student projects. We really love seeing the creations and the stuff that, that you students and you teachers make out there. So uh, anytime that you wanted to share some of that stuff with us, we'd be more than happy to see those things. Um, and that's how you share your programs and things like that. So uh, feel free to do that and share that. Um, and uh, also, you know, what 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 comes next? Keep working through this hour of code and do a bunch of other hours of code as well. You can take full courses, you know, with Code HS. We have so many courses and so many ways for you to learn how to code and and learn about computer science and different languages and different industries. And we have a career center if you're curious about how you know careers are impacted by coding. People like Kate Marshall that are out there in the in the field. Um, We've got a bunch of projects and just really awesome stuff. And we always encourage you to explore Code HS and all the different things that we have to offer. And if you're not done today and you, or you just want to keep working, you can always go back to the link uh, that you used to sign up today. And that's just codehs.com slash HOC underscore VR. Hour of Code is uh, HOC short for Hour of Code. And uh, we really, really appreciate you joining us and checking this out. Whether you're live with us right now or you check this out, uh, once the recording is posted uh, to the internet, which will be um, in the very near future as well. Uh, so also, as you get to the end of your activity, uh, you can go and, and share your virtual world's badge. You get a badge for completing the hour of code. And uh, when I used to use Code HS in the classroom, um, and I would have students that were in Intro to Computer Science or AP, and we'd do a bunch of hours of code and other things like that. And uh, my students got a little competitive with their badges. And we had, we made little websites using the codehs.me. And uh, we would, they would collect their badges and put them all on their websites. So uh, you can print a certificate for this. You can do another hour of code and you can take your badge and, uh, and you can go from there. So I really, really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. We would uh, appreciate it if you take a picture of this QR code or scan this QR code with your camera and uh, let us know how we did and um, stay in touch with us, you know, at codehs.com and, and uh, you can join the community, our community on Facebook as well. And uh, thank you very, very, very much for joining us. Thank you to Kate uh, for today for, for presenting. Thank you to Joni and Matt and MR and Athena for helping out and making sure that everything ran smoothly. And uh, most importantly, thank you students and teachers for being here. We really appreciate you uh, being a part of what we're doing here for this really important computer science education week and this hour of code. So if you have any other questions, you can let us know. Otherwise, uh, please keep coding, uh, uh, carry on and keep, wait, keep coding and carry on, so I, I, whatever that might be. Uh, but thank you very much for joining us today.